What is a child? On the surface, the question might have a single, a simple answer. For example, we could refer to the law. In Finland and many other countries, a child stops being a child at the age of 18 and legally becomes an adult. On the other hand, a human being under the age of 18 can have an abortion without parental consent. How can we make sense of these seemingly internal contradictions? What are the concepts that inform the laws concerning children? In my talk today, I focus on the concept child. Why do we call some human beings adult and others child? To start answering this question, I consult the history of ideas and my inquiry moves from focusing on a child to child. So from a child to child, although we constantly use the concept child as therapists, lawyers, grandparents, parents, social workers, doctors, anthropologists, architects, teachers, teacher educators, childhood researchers, you name it. What child is escapes being pinned down or grasped by an easy definition. Although the concept child might be commonly used and, cent and is central in the way we think and do things in the professions and academic research, the meaning of the concept is contestable. Now, why is this? For a start, what counts as child differs historically. Some people have argued that childhood is, for example, a modern invention. That although children are smaller physically in earlier periods, they were regarded as being capable of many adult-like responsibilities. Little adults, in fact. Look at old paintings. For example, where children are portrayed as miniature grown-ups. What counts as child also differs across cultures and geographical locations. For example, people claim in Africa that the child remains child of his or her parents even after their death. Childhood is not what someone leaves behind. Also, in many parts of the world, children carry adult responsibilities, for example, looking after their younger siblings on their own, herding cattle, working on the land, or helping in market stores. The concept child is philosophically deceivingly complex. Influenced by Western theories and monotheistic religions, current definitions of child tend to use the adult human body against which child is measured and found wanting. It measures child against what she does not have compared with a fully adult human. Now the etymology of infant, in, infant here is infant that is not speaking. A child is regarded as a human that cannot speak yet, or not as well, at least, as an adult. But this is crucially important because speech is used to measure intelligence. An intelligent, mature person, in other words, an adult human, is rational, thinks in abstractions, is in control of emotions, and leaves the personal, domestic, and every day out of knowledge production, a brain on a stick. Even the United Nations Convention on the Right of the Child assumes that the end goal of childhood is the formation of an adult citizen. This adult is capable of living individually and contributing productively to a Western-style liberal democracy. The adult is the accepted valued norm and child is a lesser, still maturing adult in the making childish, less competent and less useful. For example, Article 12 of the Convention states that children, I quote, lack the full autonomy of adults and that their ability to form and express their opinions develops with age and maturity. These ideas about child as immature and underdeveloped are familiar, but they're very damaging. The way we build relationships with children and listen to them has been shaped by Western philosophical and educational theories, with stark dichotomies that exclude, discriminate and colonize. Certain figurations of child and childhood have become so ingrained and solidified habits of mind that they've left marks on our bodies. Child is clearly a political category. So where exactly do these ideas come from? So I would like to present six key figurations of child visualized by South African editorial cartoonist Brendan Reynolds. They are ways of thinking about child and childhood that have become so normalized that we're not even aware of them. 
These figurations shape teaching, research across faculties, educational policies, and often sentimentalized adult imaginaries. They frame debates about the proportional influence of nature and culture on children's development, zigzagging between opposite poles. The relationship between nature and culture is often expressed in percentages. For example, intelligence is 20% genetically determined and 80% shaped by upbringing, for example. I explore them in more depth elsewhere, but briefly all these figurations assume childhood as an inferior stage in human development, with a mature, developed, rational, autonomous adult as the normative ideal. Moreover, all these figurations assume that intelligence is of a particular kind. They also assume a dichotomy between nature and culture, distancing child from adults who have been assigned clear roles to tame, civilize and domesticate the wild younger human who's regarded as not being politically equal or morally on a par with an adult. The figurations of the development, developing child draws especially on ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle. Like an acorn developed into an oak tree, child is unfinished and incomplete by nature and therefore requires fertile soil and the right conditions for growth and maturation through the correct guidance by adults. The figuration of the ignorant child lacks rationality and intelligence. As an empty vessel, child is waiting to be filled. Now, influenced by philosophers Aristotle and John Locke, child needs experiences and therefore training. Influenced by philosopher Plato, child lacks reason and therefore needs instruction by an adult. Now, the figuration of the evil child is influenced in particular by Protestantism. Child is born essentially sinful and can therefore not be trusted. The task of culture is control and discipline as in the current meaning of disciple. The aim is to surrender one's authority to someone else, a truth outside oneself. So teaching is a drawing in to establish systems of thought. And the preferred method is inculcation. It comes from Latin, forcing upon or stamping in. The key influence for the figuration of the innocent child, on the other hand, has been philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who argued that childhood as a special time of vulnerability needs to unfold naturally with as little intervention as possible. The adult is positioned as facilitator of learning and child is positioned as lacking responsibility and therefore requires protection. However, innocence is a white privilege and is systematically denied to brown bodies. The figuration on the hand of the egocentric child draws in particular on the still dominant influence of the theories of psychologist Jean Piaget. Child lacks social norms and cultural values, cannot empathize or decenter in the imagination and requires socialization and inculcation by elders. The figuration on the other hand of the fragile child rests upon psychomedical scientific models. Children are seen as vulnerable, lacking resilience, and are in need of protection and medication for normalization. The fragile child lacks resilience by nature and therefore needs culture to diagnose, protect, possibly medicate, and teachers to remediate. The problem with these figurations is that they underpin research practices that privilege intelligence of a particular kind, as mentioned earlier. To do justice to the reality of a child, awareness of how the concept child would is crucial. So how can we research with children without already assuming normative, man-made binaries such as nature, culture, and adult, child, and ex that exclude before research has even started? Reconfiguring the concept child involves including different ways of understanding the world we are a part of. What child is is much more complex than what can be captured through language alone and requires immersion in lived experiences not just by focusing on the individual child, but also on the so-called in-betweens, such as affect, atmosphere, sound, wind, animals, 
the past, the futures, and all the elements that are entangled with how we understand a child and her capabilities. Child is always already part of intricate human and non-human relational networks, including the technology that co-creates research data. These trans individual elements are not just in the background, like the everyday background noises right now during my talk. They are intricately entangled with knowledge production itself. My research involves regarding all humans, not just children, as events, dynamic, relational processes, as becomings rather than individual static subjects, like zipped bodies. My proposition is to reconfigure humans of any age as indeterminate and unbounded nature culture systems. Such research is urgently needed for justice to which children and culture exploits nature in various shapes and forms. Thank you.